from men. I will analyze some spaces, what, what in Musa Malawi we've called spaces of, of vulnerability in the context of poverty and money. That's the first analysis I'll give. I'll give other analysis later on, but I just want you to understand this is just one of the areas, but a very important area. And I've picked three areas uh, in this particular regard. I've picked what we call fish for sex. I've picked what we call tea work for sex. I've picked what we call filed for sex. Now, what is fish for sex? Uh, um, those of you who, who have been to Malawi or know about Malawi or have seen it on the map, you find out that Malawi is a, is a relatively small country, but overpopulated with about 12 million people, uh, if you consider the size of the country. However, one of the beautiful things about Malawi is that it lies along the lake. It's got uh, the third largest lake in, 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 in Africa. Um, so it, it, it lies along the Rift Valley. It's a very beautiful lake. Now, this lake produces fish, like most lakes, tilapia, what we call jambo, among so many other fish. Now, the whole fishing business has a, an element of genderization of the labor market and the genderization of raw of fishing. Fishing is done by men. Men are the ones who go out to fish because there's a perception and a cultural belief that if women go, they'll drown, or the fish will go away, or, you know, or things like that. And I mean, seriously, you can engage, you can have arguments the whole day, and they'll be like, let the women go. you see what will happen to them. <laughs> so as a result, it's men who bring this very important resource called fish. And they bring it to the, to the, lakes of, uh, to, to the shores of Lake Malawi. So what happens then, the, the row, the row start to shift. The offloading of the fish from the boat onto the rack. You know, you have a rack where you dry the fish. It's, it's a women's job. Now, so it's not every woman who stands there and say, you know, oh yeah, there's, um, there's a boat and then you go and get, no. There are special relationships that are created. Because it's a business, you're offloading fish, it's a business. Not everybody gets business. You have to create uh, special relationships in order to offload that. So you find that women are given special relationships. I mean, they have special relationships with the fishermen, and they go and offload the boat, uh, the fish from the boat or onto the, to the fishing rack. That kind of relationship is not just um, entrenched in loyal and familiar relationships. It's also entrenched in sex as a bargaining too. You know, those who are able to give sex, I can be given the business to offload fish onto the rack. It's a reality. It is normal. It is not unusual. But even if you go beyond that, you find that for, you know, the, for, for, for the women to buy, sometimes they need to, for, not sometimes, they need to buy the fish in order to give it to their families, or they want to buy it in order to sell it again. You know, even that, the buying of, I'm not talking about to be given, because the operative word is not being given the fish. The operative word is to buy. But then, who is in, who is in charge? It's the men. They are the ones who are able to bring the fish, and they have to sell it to you. There are so many people wanting to buy the fish. Why should I give it to you and not the other person? You understand? So for women to be able to buy the fish, they also have to use sex as a bargaining tool. This is the analysis of fish for sex. And when women say, you know what, if I have to choose between me and you know, going to, to, to bed without food or without you know, having, getting, getting some money from the floating and worrying about 10 years of, you know, of a, a disease that is going to eat me after 10 years, what do you think I'm going to choose? I'm going to choose to float the fish, you know, and do whatever. They, they, when the disease comes, it will find me later. Those are the choices that women are forced to make. So that's fish for sex. So let me also give you another um, scenario. is the firewood for sex. Now, those of you in the green movement, forest, don't cut trees, it's bad, whatever. 
But you know, um, I also say, but do they know where these African women are getting their source of energy from? Because we don't have this gas thing. Electricity is very rare. It's only in small, small cities. I mean, you just have to look at the. In fact, this is not very complicated. When you, there are these maps that are circulating on internet that show that, uh, that people, I think NASA has been taken from the sky. We show Africa, Europe, um, America, from the sky at night. Guess which one doesn't show light? So it's not a very complicated analysis. I also just take the photos and show them to people. They need to tell you a whole story. So well, the government have bought into this idea of the green movement. Therefore, don't cut trees. You know, those who cut trees, they shall be arrested and all that. So women are the ones who, who provide uh, uh, fuel for cooking, for whatever in the homes. There's no other alternative source of fuel apart from wood. That is a fact. But then the government, in response to the green movement, has placed what we call forest guards in the forest to guard those women who come to here to cut wood. They'll be arrested. Or if not, they have to pay a fine of seven kwacha, which is about, OK, roughly about seven cents. Now, that's, that's hard money to get by. You know, seven, seven quarter is not, if you had it, you'd rather buy salt. You know, not pay a forest guard as a fine. How many, after how many times are you going to pay this particular fine? So we, when women venture into the forest to, so they, they do it like they are, you know, they, they're hiding. So when they get, the forest guard say, ha, huh, I've caught you. I'm now going to take you to the, to the office where they, you're going to get arrested because you've been engaging in an illegal business. So the woman says, oh, but you know what? My children will die, whatever. Says, oh, yeah, so you just, you know what to do, you know. You know, otherwise you're going. So the, the woman says, okay, whatever, we can do whatever. Say, okay. So sex be, because also becomes a, an exchange of, you know, they, they sleep with the forest guards. And I thought, the first time I heard it was just a rumor. I thought, oh, come on, you guys, this is ridiculous. So when we're engaging this research, we decided to, to engage the forest guards. They are like, but these women, they come knowing that it's illegal. It means they want to have the sex. You know, you know it means they want it. So we're like, but you know, there's no other, so, you know, that, that level of analysis about other, other sources of uh, fuel is a, is a very sophisticated analysis. They say the government has said we must stand here and guard those, against those women. If they come here, they're looking for trouble. You go to the women, the women say, what do we do? Show us where else we're going to get the firewood from. So again, the, the sex for firewood business continues, you know, uh, and, and so on and so forth. When we engage the government to say what is going on, they say, ah, but you know what? We've signed some agreements internationally, so we have to show that we are responding. Otherwise, you know, we'll look back. You know, that, that sort of thing. It's, it's a long chain. So the, this continues. And of course, it's high risk, uh, it's high risk sex, it's, you know, and so on. And then the, la the, one, um, the last one is the... Um, <coughs> Uh, uh, the tea work for, for sex. We grow a lot of tea in Malawi. Uh, the famous tea is called Chambo. Chombe, Chombe, not Chambo, Chombe. Uh, there, you know, if you come to, there are two districts in Malawi, um, uh, Mulanji and Cholo. When you just enter those districts, it's all green with tea. It's very beautiful. Um, it's, 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 a, it's a private business. It, it, it employs about 42,000 people. That's a lot in the context of Malawi. You know, for, for you know, casual labor to, to pluck, to, to, you know, to harvest the tea and so on. And in the process, they also employ women. But women are employed at a very small, at a very small margin. However, even to get the job of tea plucking, the heads, uh, what we call them capitals, is a captains, you know. The, the word capital comes from the uh, colonial word captain because they used to be called captain and we didn't understand that because it's English so we, used, we just tended to capital. So this, these capitals are the ones who employ people the casual labor. So they say, you see, there are no women here. So if you want a job, you know, you know we, uh, we have to have sex as a bargaining too. And even when, let's say, uh, during the law season when people have been offlaid, and women are so scared of you know, going hungry, it's the same thing. So they call it, we, we call it tea work for, for sex. And again, it's, 
normal. And it continues up to this day. As we are talking, it is continuing. I'm not talking about things that happened yesterday. This research is as recent. And it is just uncovering things that have been going on for years. Now, moving on from that, uh, let me move away from this uh, tea, for, tea, you know, tea work for sex, uh, fire, uh, firewood for sex, and fish for sex, and look at other, uh, uh, other lived realities. First of all, let me look at the whole construction of sex and sexuality. You know, when I, when I come here to the West, or even this, you know, with these globalization magazines, are cosmopolitan, eh, you know, you open cosmopolitan, tantric sex, how to have tantric sex, I mean. <laughs> this is interesting, you know. <laughs> so um, the reason why I'm bringing this is, is that when I talk about the perception of sex and sexuality, all I'm saying is it's all over. It's all over the world. Different cultures have different ways of talking about sex. In some cultures, it's about cosmopolitan and how to have sex and how to have this sort of thing. For us, we also have our own perceptions about sex and sexuality. So we have messages which are saying A, B, C, um, abstain, be faithful, and condomize. Oh, yes, that's right. Oh, condomize. You can say that again. So when we engage people to say, you know what, we just don't understand why we are not engaging in safe sex because we have to. They've said that this is the best way. And people say, but safe sex, sex with a condom is not sex. It's not real. So you can have sex with a condom today, but you still won't have real sex with a person. Because real sex means sex without a what? A condom. So yes, we see these billboards, we say whatever, but in our minds, that's a reality. So it's very difficult to continue to have a constant relationship with, with a condom. <laughs> and the whole issue, of course, of uh, 